Shu Dong, Ba Zhu, Gil, 1976. Now that weight curtain passed our bank crisis, now that I was reasonably sure of not going to jail, I could go back to asking the chief questions. Which are we trying to build here? What kind of company do we want to be? Like most companies, we had role models. Sony, for instance, Sony was the apple of its day, profitable, innovative, efficient, and it treated its workers well. When pressed, I often said I wanted to be like Sony. At root, however, I still aimed and hoped for something bigger and better. I was such many mind and heart, and the only thing I could come up with was this word, winning. It wasn't much, but it was far, far better than the alternative. Whatever happened, I just didn't want to lose. Wasn't was that. Blair Ribbon was my third child, my business child, as Sumeragi said, and I simply couldn't bear the idea of it dying. It has to live, I told myself. It just has to. That's all I know. Several times in those first months of 1976, I huddled with highs and virtual and stressful at over sandwiches and sodas with kick around this question of ultimate goals, this question of winning and losing. Money wasn't our aim, we agreed. Money wasn't our end game, but whatever our aim or end, money was the only means to get there. More money than we had on hand. Niso was alone in us millions, and their relationship felt sound, solidified by the recent crisis. Best partners you will ever have. Chef Robinson had been right. But to keep up with demand, to continue growing, we needed millions more. Our new bank was loaning us money, which was good, but because they were a small bank, we had already reached their legal limit. At some point, in those 1976, virtual stressor highs, discussions we sorry to talk about the most logical, arithmetical solution, which was also the most difficult one emotionally. Going public. On one level, of course, the idea made perfect sense. Going public would generate a ton of money in a flash, but it would also be highly powerless because going public often mean losing control. It could mean working for someone else. Suddenly, when answerable to stockholders, hundreds or maybe thousands of strangers, many of whom will be large investment firms. Going public could turn us overnight into the thing we looked, the thing we spent our lives running from. For me, there was an added consideration, a semantic one. Defined by shyness, intensively private. I found the phrase itself off bottom going public. No, thank you. And yet, during my nightly run, I sometimes ask myself, hasn't your life been a kind of search for connection? Running for Bowerman, backpacking around the world, starting a company, marrying Penny, assembling this brand of brothers at Blue Ribbon School? Hasn't it all been about, one way or another, going public? In the end, however, I decided, we decided, going public wasn't right. It's just not for us. I said, and we said, no way, never. Meeting urgent. So we set about casting for other ways to raise money. One way found us. First State Bank asked us to apply for a million dollar loan which the U.S. Small Business Administration would then guarantee. It was a loophole, a way for a small bank to gently expand its credit line because their guaranteed loan limits were greater than their direct loan limits. So we did it, mainly to make their life easier. As is always the case, the process turned out to be more complicated than it first appeared. First State Bank and the Small Business Administration required Bowman and I, as majority shareholders, both personally, guaranteed the loan. We'd done 
that at first National and at Bank of California, so I didn't see a problem. I was in hook up to my neck. There was one more guarantee. Bowman, however, bought retired living on a fixed income. This pirated after the traumas of the last few years and greatly weakened by the death of pre. He didn't want any more risk. He feel all in his mountain. Rather than give his personal guarantee, he offered to give me two thirds of a stake in Florida at a discounted price. He was born out. I didn't want this. Never mind that I didn't have the money to buy, buy his stake. I didn't want to lose the cornerstone of my company, the anchor of my psyche. But Bowman was adamant, and I knew better than to argue. So we both went to Chekwa and asked him to help broker the deal. Chekwa was still Bowman's best friend, but I'd come to think of him as a close friend too. I still trusted him completely. Let's not fully dissolve the partnership, I said to him, though I reluctantly agreed to buy Bowman's stake. Low payment, spread over five years. I begged him to retain a percentage, stay on as a vice president and member of our small board. Till, he said, we all shook hands. While we were busy moving around stakes and dollars, the dollar itself was Hammerhagen, will you? It was all at once in a dead spiral against the Japanese yen, coupled with rising Japanese labor rates. This was now the most imminent threat to our existence, with increased and diversified sources of production, with added new factories in New England and Puerto Rico. But we were still doing nearly all our manufacturing in, vo- in volatile Japan, Nippon rubber. A sudden crippling shortage of supply was a real possibility, especially given the spike in demand for Bowman's rival trainer. With its unique archer sole and its ploy midsole cushion and its low market price, $24.95, the rival trainer was continuing to capture the popular imagination like no previous shoe. It didn't just feel different or fit different, it looked different. Radically so. Bright red dapper, fat white sauce, it was a revolution in aesthetics. A slow was drawing hundreds of thousands of new customers into the Nike fold, and this performance was sealing their loyalty. It had better traction and cushioning than anything on the market. Watching that shoe evolve in 1976 from popular accessory to cultural artifact, I had a thought. People might start wearing this thing to class and the office and the grocery store and throughout your everyday lives. It was a rather grandiose idea. Adidas had had limited success converting athletic shoes to everyday wear. With the stain Smith Tan shoe and a country running shoe, but neither was nearly as distinctive or popular or the wearful trainer. So I ordered our factories to start making the waffle trainer in blue, which would go better with jeans, and that's when it really took off. We couldn't make enough. Retailers and sales reps were on their knees, pleading for all the waffle trainers we could ship. The soaring pure counts were transforming our company, not to mention the industry. We were seeing numbers that redefined our long-term goals because they gave us something we'd always liked, an identity. More than a brand, Nike was now be- becoming a household word to such an extent that we would have to change the company name. Blue Ribbon. We decided has run its course. We would have to incorporate as Nike Inc. And for this newly named entity to stay vibrant, to keep growing, to survive the declining dollar, we'd need as always to ramp up production. Sales reps on the knees that wasn't sustainable, we'd need to find more manufacturing hubs outside Japan. Our existing factories in America and Puerto Rico would help, but they weren't nearly enough. Too old, too few, too expensive. So, in the spring of 1976, it was finally time to turn to Taiwan. For our point, 
man in Taiwan I looked to Jim Common, a valued employee, long known for his almost fanatical loyalty to Nike. Raised in a series of foster homes, Gorman seemed to find in Nike the family. He'd never had, and thus he was always a good sport, always a team player. It was common, for instance, for drawn the unpleasant task of driving Ketami to the airport back in 1972. After that final issue down in Jack was conference room, and he did without complaint. It was common for chicken over the arching stove from virtual. The toughest of acts to follow, it was Gorman who wore the par, Nike spikes in the 1972 Olympic trials. In every instance, Gorman had done a fine job and never uttered a sore word. He seemed the perfect candidate to take on the latest mission impossible, Taiwan. But first, I need to give him a crash course on Asia. So, I scheduled the trip, just the two of us. On the flight overseas, Gorman proved to be an hour student, a vicious sponge. He quelled me about my experiences, my opinions, my reading, and wrote down every word I said. I felt as if I was back in school, teaching a ball in state, and I liked it. I remembered that the best way to reinforce your knowledge of a subject is to share it. So we both benefited from a transferring everything I knew about Japan, Korea, China, and Taiwan to come in spring. Shoe producers, I told him, are abandoning Japan and mass, and they are all landing in two places, Korea and Taiwan. Both countries specialize in low-price footwear, but Korea has elected to go with a few giant factories, whereas Taiwan is building a hundred small ones. So that's why we are choosing Taiwan. Our demand is too high, our volume too low, for the biggest factories, and in small factories will have the dominant position, while being charged. Of course, the tougher challenge was to get any factory we choose to upgrade this quality, and then there was the constant threat of political instability. President Chiang Kai-shek had just died, I told Kerman, and after 25 years in command he was leaving a nasty power vacuum. For good measure, she always needed to account for Taiwan's ancient tensions with China. On and on, I talked as we sailed over the Pacific. While taking copious notes, Garmin also came up with new, fresh ideas, which gave me new insights, things to think about. Stepping off the plane in Taichung, our first stop. I was delighted. The sky was intense, energetic, eager to get started. I was proud to be his mentor. Key choice, I told myself. By the time we reached the hotel, however, Gorman was welcome. Touching looked and smelled like the far end of the galaxy. A vast megalopolis of smoking factories and thousands of people per square foot. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen and I'd been all over Asia. So of course, it overwhelmed poor Gorman. I saw in his eyes and typical first timer's reaction to Asia. The look of alienation and circuit overload. He looked exactly like Penny when she met me in Japan. Steady, I told him, take it one day, one factory at a time. Follow your manager's lead. Over the next week, we visited and toured about two dozen factories. Most were big, dark, dirty, and workers going through the motions had both wicked looks in their eyes. Just outside Taicheng, However, in the small town of Jolio, we found a factory that showed promise. It was called Feng Tai, and it was managed by a young man named C. H. Wong. Small but clean, it had a positive vibe, as did Wong, a shoe dog who lived for his workplace. And in it, when we noticed that one small room of the factory floor was off limits, he asked what was in there. Home, he said. That is where my wife and I and our three kids live. I was reminded of Johnson. I decided to make Feng Chai the cornerstone of our Taiwan effort. When we were in touring factories, Gorman and I were being fatted by factory owners. They stuffed us with local delicacies, some of which were actually cooked, and plied us with something called a Mao Tai, which was a Mai Tai. 
but apparently we shoe cream instead of rum. Jet lag. Garmin and I both have lost our tolerance. After two maltais, we were bothered. We tried to slow down, but our hearts kept raising their glasses. To Nike. To America. At the final dinner of our Taichung visit, Garmin repeatedly excused himself and ran to the men's room to splash cold water on his face. Every time he left the table, I got rid of my matai by pouring it into his war glass. Each time he returned from the men's room, there was another toast, and Comet thought he was playing it safe by raising his war glass. To our American friends, to our Taiwanese friends, after another huge gulp of spiked water, Comet looked at me, panic stricken. I think I'm going to pass out, he said. Have some more water? I said. Tastes funny. No, despite of loading my boots onto Carmen, I was woozy when I got back to my room. I had trouble getting ready for bed. I had trouble finding the bed. I fell asleep while brushing my teeth. Midbrush. I woke some time later and tried to find my extra contact lenses. I found them, then dropped them on the floor. There was a knock. Carmen. He walked in and asked me something about our next day's itinerary. He found me on my hands and knees, searching for my contact lenses in the pillow of my own sick. Phil, you okay? Follow your mattress lead, I mumbled. That morning, we flew to Taipei, the capital, and toured a couple more factories. In the evening, we strolled in Shang South Road, with its dozens of shrines and temples, churches, and mosques. The road to heaven, locals called it. Indeed, I told Carmen, ancient means new life. When we returned to our hotel, I got a strange and unexpected phone call. Jerry, Shay, pronounced Shay, was paying his respects. I'd met Shay before, in one of the shoe factories I'd visited the year before. He was working for Miss Bush and the Great Genius Central. He'd impressed me with his intensity and work ethic and shoot. Unlike all the other she dogs I'd met, he was young, twenty something, and looked much younger, like an overgrown chiller. He said he'd heard me were in the country, then like a CIA operative, he added, I know why you are here. He invited us to visit him in his office, an invitation that seemed to indicate he was now working for himself, not Miss Sibushi. I went down Shay's office address and crept common. The concierge at our hotel to US map, which proved useless. Shay's office was in an unmapped part of the city, the worst part. Common and I walked down a series of unmapped lanes up a series of unnumbered alleys. Did you see a street sign? I can barely see the street. We must have gotten lost a dozen times. Finally, there it was, a stout building of old red brick. Inside we found a precarious staircase. The handrail came off in our hands as we walked up to the third floor and each stone step had steep indentation from contact with a million shoes. Ancho, she shouted when we knocked. We found him sitting in the middle of a room that looked like the nest of a giant rat. Everywhere we looked were shoes and more shoes and parts of shoe pieces, soles and laces and tongue. She jumped to his feet cleared a space for us to sit. He offered us tea, then while the water boiled, he began educating us. Did you know that every country in the world has many, many customs and superstitions about shoes? He grabbed a shoe from a shelf, had it before our faces. Did you know that in China, when man marries woman, they throw red shoe on the roof to make sure all goes well on body night? He rotated the shoe in a scanty light that managed to fight through the crime on his windows. He told us which factory it came from, why he thought it was well made, how it could have been made better. Did you know that in many countries, when someone starts on a journey, it's actually good luck to throw a shoe at them. He grabbed another shoe, extended it, like Hamlet holding Yorick's skull. He identified its provenance, its prominence told us why it was purely made, why it would soon fall apart, then tossed it aside with disdain. 
The difference from one shoe to another, he said, nine times out of ten, is the factory. Forget design, forget color, forget all the other things that go into a shoe. It's all about factories. I listened closely and took notes, like government on the like government on the plane. Through the whole time, I was thinking its performance. He's putting on his shoe, trying to sell us. He doesn't realize that we need him more than he needs us. Now, Shay went into his pitch. He told us that in exchange for a small fee, he'd gladly connect us with the very best factories in Taiwan. This had the potential to be big. We could use someone on the ground to pave our way, to make introductions, to help government acclimate. An Asian gun patrol. We haggled over commission per peer for a few minutes, but it was a friendly haggling. Then we shook hands. Deal. Deal. We sat down again and drew up an agreement to establish a Taiwan-based sub-company. What you call it? I didn't want to use Nike. If we ever wanted to do business in the People's Republic of China, we couldn't be associated with China's son enemy. It was a faint hope, a best, an impossible dream. But still, so I picked Athena, the Greek goddess who prints Nike. Athena Co. And thus, I preserved the unmapped, unnumbered road to heaven, or a shoe dog's idea of heaven, a country with two billion feet. I sent government home ahead of me. Before leaving Asia, I told him I needed to make one quick stop in Manila. Personal errand, I said vaguely. I went to Manila to visit the shoe factory, a very good one. Then closing an old loop. I spent the night in Mac Arthur's too. You remembered for the rules to break? Maybe, maybe not. It was the bicentennial year, the strange moment in America's cultural history, the 365J, Lola Palosa of self examination and civics license, and semi nightly fireworks. From January 1 to December 31st of the year, he couldn't change the channel without hitting upon a movie. A documentary about George Washington, or Ben Franklin, or Lexington, and Concord, and invariably embedded in the patriotic programming, there would be yet another bicentennial minute, a public service announcement in which Dick Van Dyke, or Lucille Ball, or Gabe Kaplan would recount some episode that took place on the stage during the revolutionary era. One night, it might be Jessica Tandy talking about the falling of the Liberty Tree. The next night, it might be President Gerald Ford exhorting all Americans to keep this part of 76 alive. It was all somewhat conny, a little bit sentimental, and immensely moving. The year-long swell of patriotism brought out an already strong love of country in me. Tall ships sailing into New York Harbor, restations of the Bill Right and Declaration of Independence. Fervent talk of liberty, justice, it all refreshed my gratitude about being an American and being free and not being in jail. At the 1976 Olympic trials, how to gain the tune in Archie, Nike had a chance, fantastic chance to make a good show. We'd never had the chance with Tiger, whose spikes weren't chop caliber. We'd never had the chance with the first generation of Nike products. Now, alas, we had our own stuff, and it was a really good. Chop quality marathon shields and spikes, we were buzzing with excitement as we left Poland. Finally, we said we are going to have a Nike shield runner make an Olympic team. It was going to happen. It needed to happen. Bunny and I drove to Argentine, where we met up with Johnson, who was photographing the event. Despite our excitement about the trials, we talked most about Pre as we took our seats in the packed voyagers. It was clear that Pre was on everyone else's mind too. We heard his name coming from every direction, and his spirit seemed to hover like the low clouds rolling about the track. And if you were tempted to forget him, even for a moment, you got an other bracing reminder when you looked at the runner's feet. Many were wearing pre materials Many more were wearing exertion made products like the Trim and the Vancara. Hey, what the day looked like in Nike show. It was well known that these trials would have been the start of Pre's epic comeback. After being knocked down in Monique, he'd have risen again, no doubt. 
in the rising would have been right here, right now. Each race prompted the same thoughts, the same image pre busting ahead of the path, pre diving through the tape. We can see it. We can see him flush with victory. If only we kept saying our voices chalk him. If only. At sunset, the sky turned red, white, and the tea blackish blue. But it was still bright enough to read by as the runners in the 10,000 meters gathered at the starting line. Penny and I tried to clear our minds as we stood, hands clasped, as if in prayer. We were counting on Shorer. Of course, he was extremely talented, and he'd been the last person to see pre alive. It made sense that he'd be the one to carry pre torch. But we also had Nike's own Craig Virgin, a brilliant young runner from the University of Illinois, and on Gary Joclon, a lovable veteran from Minnesota, who was trying to come back from surgery to remove a little spot in his foot. The gun went off, the runner shot forward, all bunch tied, and Penny and I were bunch tied too, owing and eyeing with every stride. There wasn't an inch of separation in the pack until the half a mile when Shara and Virgin violently pushed their head in the jostling. Virgin accidentally stepped on Jocelyn and sent his Nike flying. Now Jocelyn's tando, surgically repaired foot was bare, exposed, smiking the hat trick with every stride. And yet, Jocelyn didn't stop. He didn't falter. He didn't even slow down. He just kept running. Faster and faster. And the blazing cheer of courage won over the crowd. I think we cheered for him as loudly as we had cheered for Pre the year before. Entering the final lap, Shower and Virgin were in front. Penny and I were jumping up and down. We are going to get two, we said. We are going to get two, and then we got three. Shower and Virgin took first and second, and Jocelyn plunged ahead of Bill Rogers at the tip to take I was covered with three, three Olympians and Nikes. The next morning, rather than take a victory lap at Howard, we set up camp at the Nike store. While Johnson and I mingled with customers, Penny manned the skill screen machine and changed out Nike t-shirts. Her craftsmanship was exquisite. All day long, people came in to say they'd seen someone wearing a Nike, wearing a Nike t-shirt on the street and just had to have one for themselves. Despite our continual melancholy about pre, we allowed ourselves to feel joy because it was becoming clear that Nike was doing more than making a good show. Nike was dominating those strides. Virgin took the 5,000 meters in Nikes. Charles won the marathon in Nikes. Slowly in the show, in the town, we heard people whispering, Nike, Nike, Nike. We heard our name more than the name of any athlete, besides Pre. Saturday afternoon, walking into Howard to visit Powerman, I heard someone behind me say, Geez, Nike is really kicking Adidas' ass. It might have been the highlight of the weekend of this year, followed closely by the Puma sale. Rep I spotted moments later leaning against a tree and looking suicidal. Bowman was there strictly as a spectator, which was strange for him and us, as yet he was wearing his standard uniform, the righty sweater, the low ball cape. At one point, he formally requested a meeting in a small office under the East Grandstand. The office wasn't really an office, more like a closet, where the crumbs keepers stored their rakes and prunes in the few canvas shoes. There was barely room for the coach and Johnson and me, never mind the others invited by the coach, Hollister and Dennis Whitty, a local podiatrist who worked with Bowman as a shoe consultant. As we shut the door, I noticed Bowman didn't look like himself. At priest's funeral, he seemed old, now he seemed lost. After a minute of small talk, he started blowing. He complained that he wasn't getting any respect anymore from Nike, who had built him a home lab and supplied him with a lasting machine. But he said that he was constantly asking in vain for raw materials from its searcher. Johnson looked horrified. What materials? He asked. I asked for shoe, uppers, and my request are ignored, Bowman said. Johnson turned to Vixie. I sent you the apples, he said. Vixie, didn't you get them? 
Witty licked Poplex. Yes, I caught them. Bowman took off his ball cape, put it back on, took it off. Yeah, well, he crumbled. But you didn't send the outer souls. Johnson's face reddened. I sent those too. Vixie? Yes, Vixie said. We caught them. Now we all turned to Bowman, who was pacing, or trying to. There was no room. The office was dark, but I could still tell that my old coach face was turning red. Well, we didn't get them on time. He shouted, and the tines of the wreck trembled. This wasn't about uppers and outer souls. This was about retirement and time. Like pre, time wouldn't listen to Bowman. Time wouldn't slow down. I'm not going to put up with this bullshit anymore. He huffed and stomped out, leaving the jaw swinging up. I looked at Johnson and Rixie and Hollister. They all looked at me. It didn't matter if Bowman was right or wrong, we just had to find a way to make him feel needed and useful. If Bowman isn't happy, I said, Nike isn't happy. A few months later, Maggie Montreal was the setting for Nike's grand debut, our Olympic coming out party. As those 1976 games opened, we had at least in several high-profile events wearing Nikes. But our highest hopes and most of our money were pinned on Shorer. He was the favorite to win gold, which meant that Nikes for the first time ever were going to cross an Olympic finish line ahead of all other shoes. This was an enormous right for passage for a running shoe company. You really weren't a legitimate, cut current running shoe company until an Olympian Ascended to the top medal standing your queue. I woke up early the Saturday, July 31st, 1976. Right after my morning coffee, I took up my position in my recliner. I had a sandwich at my elbow, cold shoulders in the fridge. I wondered if Kitami was watching. I wondered if my former bankers were watching. I wondered if my parents and sisters were watching. I wondered if the FBI was watching. The runners approached the starting line. With them, I crouched forward. I probably had as much adrenaline in my system as Shorrow had in his. I waited for the pistol and for the invitable close-up of Shorrow's feet. The camera zoomed in. I stopped breathing. I slid out of my recliner onto the floor and crawled toward the TV screen. Number one, said, number one, cried out in anguish. No, no. He was wearing tigers. I watched in horror as the great top of Nike took off in the shoes of our enemy. I stood, walked back to my recliner, and watched the race unfold, talking to myself, mumbling to myself. Slowly the house grew dark, not dark enough to suit me. At some point, I drew the curtains, turned off the lights, but not the TV. I would watch all two hours and ten minutes to the better end. I'm still not sure I know exactly what happened. Apparently, Shara became convinced that his Nike shoes were fragile and wouldn't hold up for the whole 26 miles. Never mind, the date performed perfectly well at the Olympic trials. Maybe it was nerves, maybe it was superstition. He wanted to use what he'd always used. Runners are funny that way. In any case, at the last moment, he switched back to the shoes that he wore when he won the gold in 1972. And I switched from soda to vodka, sitting in the dark, clutching a cocktail. I told myself it was no big deal in the grand scheme of things. Shara didn't even win, and East German surprised him and took the gold. Of course, I was lying to myself. It was a very big deal, and not because of the disappointment or the lost marketing opportunity if watching Shara get off in shoes other than mine could affect me so deeply. It was now official. Nike was more than just a shoe. I no longer simply made Nikes. Nike were making me. If I saw an athlete shoes and other shoe, if I saw anyone shoes and other shoe, it wasn't just a rejection of the brand alone, but of me. I told myself to be reasonable. Not everyone in the world was going to wear Nike. 
and they once say that I became upset every time I saw someone walking down the street in a running shoe that wasn't mine, but it definitely registered, and I didn't care for it. At some point, the night I found Hollister, he was devastated too. There was raw anger in his voice. I was glad. I wanted people working for me who would feel that same burn, the same gut punch rejection. Happily, they will feel such rejections all the time. At the close of fiscal 1976, we traveled overseas, a startling number, which financial analysts noted and wrote about, and yet we were still cash poor. I kept borrowing every nickel I could, flowing it into growth with the explicit or tacit blessing of people I trusted. Virgil Strasser Heise. In early 1976, the four of us had talked tentatively about going public and tabled the idea. Now, at the close of 1976, we took up the idea again more seriously. We analyzed the risks. We analyzed the risks, weighed the cons, considered the pros. Again, we decided, no. Sure, sure we said, we'd love to have the quick infusion of capital. Oh. The things we could do with that money, the factories we could lease, the talent we could hire, but going public would change our culture, make us beholden, make us corporate. That's not our play. We all agreed. Weeks later, strapped for money again, our bank accounts at zero. We took another look at the idea and rejected it again. Wanting to settle the matter once and for all, I put the subject at the top of the agenda for our biannual gathering, a retreat with Dick to call in the bad face. Johnson coined the phrase, we think, at one of our earliest retreats, he muttered, how many multi-million dollar companies can you yell at? Hey, bad face, and the entire management team turns around, it got a laugh, and then it stopped, and then it became a key part of our vernacular. Bad face referred to both the retreat and the retreaters. And it not only captured the informal mood of those retreats, where no idea was too skilled to be mocked and no person was too important to be ridiculed. It also summed up the company's spirit, mission and ethos. The first few bad faces took place at various Oregon resorts, Autocrest, Solution. Ultimately, we came to prefer Sun, Sun River. Ultimately, we came to prefer... Ultimately, we came to prefer Sun River. Ultimately, we came to prefer. Ultimately, we came to prefer Sun River, an idyllic spot in sunny Central Oregon. Typically, Virgil and Johnson would fly out from the East Coast and we'd all drive out to Sun River. To Sun River late Friday. Would reserve a bunch of cabins, seize a country's room, and spend two or three days shouting ourselves, Horace, horse, horse, shouting ourselves, ourselves, shouting, shouting, shouting ourselves, Horace, horse, horse, shouting ourselves, horse. I can see myself so clearly at the head of a conference table, shouting, being shouted at, laughing until my voice was gone. The problems confronting us were grave, complex, seemingly insurmountable, made more so by the fact we were separated from each other by 3,000 miles. At a time when communication wasn't easy or instant, and yet we were always laughing, sometimes after a really cathartic Goofa, I'd only look around the table and feel overcome by emotion, camaraderie, loyalty, gratitude, even love, surely love. But I also remember feeling shocked that these were the men I'd assembled. These were the founding fathers of a multi-million dollar company that sold athletic shoes, a paralyzed sky, two morbidly open skies. A chain smoking guy. I was bracing to realize that in this group, the one with whom I had the most in common was Johnson. And yet, 
it was undeniable. While everyone else was laughing, writing, he'd be the same one, sitting quietly in the middle of the table reading a book. The largest voice at every but face always seemed to be highs, and the craziest. Like his good, like his good, his personality was ever expanding, adding new phobias and enthusiasms. For instance, by this time, Heiss had developed a curious obsession with heavy equipment. Because bulldozers, cherry pickers, cranes, they fascinated him. They turned him on. There's no other way to say it. Our at an early but place, we were leaving a local bar when Heiss spied a bulldozer in the field behind the lodge. He discovered, to his astonishment, the keys had been left inside, so he hopped in and moved the earth all around the field and in the parking lot, quitting only when he narrowly missed crashing several cars. Heist on a bulldozer, I thought, as much as the sush that might be our logo. I always said that Vuchel made the trains run on time. But it was Heiss who laid down the tricks. Heiss set up all the esoteric accounting systems without which the company would have crunched on a halt. When we first went from manual to automated accounting, Heiss required the first primitive machines and by constantly mounting them or pounding them with his big hammy fists. He kept them uncannily accurate. He kept them uncannily accurate. When we first started to invest in outside the United States, foreign currencies became a devilishly tricky problem and Heist set up an ingenious currency hedging system which made the spread more reliable, more predictable. Despite our hijinks, despite our eccentric teas, despite our physical limitations, I concluded in 1976 that we were a formidable team. Years later, a famous Harvard business professor studied, Nike came to the same conclusion. Normally, he said, a fund manager at a company can think tactically and strategically that company has a good future. But boy, are you lucky? More than half the bad faces think that way? Undoubtedly, we looked to any casual observer, like a sorry, motley crew, hopelessly mismatched, but in fact we were more alike than different and that gave a coherence to our goals and our efforts. We were mostly Oregon guys, which was important. We had an inborn need to prove ourselves, to show the world that we weren't hicks and hayseeds, and we were nearly all merciless self-loaders, which kept the egos in check. There was none of that smartest guy in the room foolishness. Highs, Strasser, Virgil, Johnson, each would have been the smartest guy in any room, but none believed it of himself or the next guy. Our meetings were defined by contempt, disdain, and heaps of abuse. Oh, what abuse? We call each of the terrible names, worrying down verbal blows while flirting ideas and shouting down ideas and hashing out threats to the company. The last thing we took into account was someone's feelings, including mine, especially mine, my fellow butt faces, my employees call me Bucky, the bookkeeper, constantly. I never asked them to stop, I never battled. If you showed any weakness, any sentimentality, you were dead. I remember a bad face when Stresser decided we weren't being aggressive enough in our approach. Too many bean counters in his company. Too many bean counters in this company, he said. So, before this meeting starts, I want to interject something. I prepared here a counter budget. He waved a big bundle. This right here is what we should be doing with our money. Of course, everyone wanted to see his numbers, but no one more than the numbers guy. Hayes, when we discovered that the numbers didn't add up, no one called him. We started howling. Tracer took it personally. It's the essence I'm getting at, he said. Not the specifics, the essence. The howling grew louder. So Strasser picked up his binder and threw it against the wall. Fuck all you guys, he said. The binder burst open, pages flew everywhere, and the laughter was deafening. Even Strasser couldn't help himself. He had to join in. Little wonder the Strasser nickname was Rolling Thunder. Hayes, meanwhile, was Domesday. 
which I was why, as in that way, Johnson was for factual because he tended to exaggerate and therefore everything he said needed to be divided by four. No one took it personally. The only thing truly not tolerated at the bad face was a thin skin and sobriety. At day's end, when everybody had a scratchy throat from all the abusing and laughing and problem solving, when our yellow legal plates were filled with ideas, solutions, quotations, and lists upon lists, which shift ground to the bar at the lodge and continue the meeting over drinks, many drinks. The bar was called the Owl's Nest. I love to close my eyes and remember us storming through the entrance, scattering all other patrons, or making friends of them with buy drinks for the house, then command you a corner and continue lying into each other about some problem or idea or hairbrain scheme. See the problem was mid souls not getting from point A to point B, round and round would go. Everyone speaking at once, a crawl of name calling and finger pointing, all made louder and funnier and somehow clearer by the booze. To anyone in the owl's nest, to anyone in the corporate world, it would have looked inefficient, inappropriate, even scandalous. But before the bartender gave less call, with no full well, why those mid souls weren't getting from point A to point B, and the person responsible would be contrite, I put on notice, and would have ourselves a creative solution. The only person who didn't join us in this late night reveals was Johnson. He typically go for a hat clearing run, then retreat to his room and read in bed. I didn't think he ever set foot in the owl's nest. I knew where it was. We'd always have to spend the first part of the next morning updating him on what we'd decide in his absence. In the bicentennial year alone, we were struggling with a number of unusually stressful problems. We needed to find a larger warehouse on the East Coast. We needed to transfer our sales distribution center from Holliston, Massachusetts to a new 40,000 square foot space in Greenland, New Hampshire, which was sure to be a logistical nightmare. We needed to hire an advertising agency to handle the increasing volume of print Eggs. We needed to either fix or get shut off our underperforming factories. We needed to smooth out glitches in our future program. We needed to hire a director of promotions. We needed to form a pro club, a sort of reward system for our top NBA stars. To cement their loyalty and keep them in the Nike field, we needed to approve new products like the Arsenal, a saucer baseball, plate with leather upper and vinyl polyfilm tongue, and the striker, a multi-purpose plate coat for saucer, baseball, football, softball, and field hockey. And we needed to decide on a new logo. Aside from the sush, we had a lurky script name, Nike, which was problematic. Too many people thought it was like a mic, but it was too late in the day to change the name of the company, so making the wires more reachable seemed a good idea. Danny Strickland creative director at our advertising agency had designed a block letter Nike, all caps, and nested it inside its sush. We spent days considering it, debating it. Above all, we needed to decide, once and for all, this coin public caution. In those earliest but faces, a consensus began to form. If we couldn't sustain growth, we couldn't survive, and despite our fears, Despite the risk and downsides, going public was the best way to sustain growth. And yet, in the midst of those intense discussions, in the middle of one of the most trying years in the company's history, those but face meetings were nothing but a joy. Of all those hours spent at San Rio, not one minute felt like work. It was us against the world, and we felt demand sorry for the world. That is, when we worried righteously pissed off righteously pissed off at it issue was had been misunderstood misjudged dismissed shunned by bosses spawned by luck rejected by society shortchanged by fate when looks and other natural crises 
were handed out, with each being forked by early failure, with each given ourselves to some quest, some attempt at validation or meaning, and fallen short. Hayes couldn't become a partner because he was too fat. Johnson couldn't cope in the so-called normal world of 95. Stresser was an insurance lawyer who hated insurance and lawyers. Vogel lost all his youthful dreams in one fluke accident. I got cut from the baseball team and I got my heart broken. I identified with the born loser in each bad face and vice versa and I knew that together we become winners. I still didn't know exactly what winning meant other than the losing but we seemed to be getting closer to a defining moment when that question would be settled or at least more sharply defined. Maybe going public would be that moment? Maybe going public would finally ensure that Nike will live on? If I had any doubts about Blue Ribbon's punishment team in 1976, they were mainly about me. Was it doing right by the bad faces? Giving them so little guidance? When they did well, I shrug and deliver my highest praise. Not bad. When they urge, I chill for a minute or two. Then shake it off. None of the bad faces felt the least threatened by me. What is a good thing? Don't tell people how to do things. Tell them what to do and let them surprise you with the results. It was the right tag for Patton and his GIEs. But did that make it right for a bunch of bad faces? I'm worried. Maybe I should be more hands-on. Maybe we should be more structured. But then, I think, whatever I'm doing, it must be working. Because... Mutinies are few. In fact, no one had thrown a genuine tantrum about anything, not even what they were paid, which is unheard of. In any company, big or small, the bad faces knew I wasn't paying myself much and they trusted that I was paying them what I could. Clearly, the bad faces like the culture I'd created. I trusted them wholly and didn't look over their shoulders and that bred a powerful two-way loyalty. My management style wouldn't have worked for people who wanted to be guided every step, but this group found it liberating, empowering. I let them be, let them do, let them make their own mistakes, because that's how I'd always like people to treat me. At the end of a bad face weekend, consumed with these and other thoughts, I drove back to Poland in a trance. Half video, I came out of the trance and started thinking about Penny and the boys. The bad places were like family, but every minute I spent with them was at the cost of my other family, my real family. The guilt was palpable. Often, I'd walk into my house and, and Matthew and Travis. Often, I'd walk into my house. And Matthew and Travis would meet me at the door. Where have you been? They'd ask. Daddy was with his friends. I'd say, picking them up. They'd still confused. But mommy told us you were walking. It was around this time as Nike rolled out its first children's shoes. Wally Wavell and Robbie Rod Tracer that Matthew announced he would never wear Nike so long as he lived. His way of expressing anger about my absences as well as other frustrations, Penny tried to make him understand that Daddy wasn't absent by choice. Daddy was trying to build something. Daddy was trying to ensure that he and Travis would one day be able to attend college. I didn't even bother to explain. I told myself it didn't matter what he said. Matthew never understood and Travis always understood they seemed born with these unwearing default positions. Matthew seemed to harbor some innate resentment toward me. Travis seemed congenitally devoted. What difference would a few more hours make? My fatherhood style, my management style. I was forever questioning, is it good or merely good enough? Time and again, time and again, I want to change. Time and again, I tell myself, I'd spend more time with the boys. Time and again, I'd keep the promise for a while. Then I'd fall back to my former routine. The only way I knew. Not hands off, but not hands on. This might have been the one problem I couldn't solve by brainstorming with my fellow bad faces. Vastly trickier 
then how to get midsoles from point A to point B was the question of son A and son B. How to keep them happy while keeping son C, Nike, afloat.